I'm sure that this is a feeling just about everybody has experienced before that feeling of being left out, like kind of the odd man out, the odd person out. And uh, I, I find that that can be true in my life in all kinds of different social dynamics and circumstances. It's like my life experiences just don't quite line up with everybody else's. And so I'm aware of how uncomfortable that can feel. So with that in mind, you know, I think about that in terms of like gathering together for worship services or even in communicating and talking about the scriptures. Like you probably never hear me say, hey, you guys all remember, you know, uh, Mephibosheth. You can you remember Mephibosheth, you know, from the Old Testament. You know, I, I would never, I wouldn't do that to you because then, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute, who remembers Mephibosheth and what was he about and, and what was that all about? Because I, I know what it feels like to kind of be excluded from that. And I had one of those experiences uh, recently. The, the U.S. Open of golf is being, uh, was played in uh, Brookline, Mass. at the Country Club. And it's a really exclusive club, but it's close. And, and I've known about this club. And yeah, I would love to play golf on this golf course. So this is my shameless pitch. If you've got connections, Connections. Um, I am in and available and I can take a Sunday off, whatever you need. I'm available. I will make it work. Um, but I've never, never played the, the course before. And I was sitting at a table with a group of guys and uh, there were like eight of us at this table and a guy comes up and he sits down and he goes, guys, have any of you ever played the country club in Brookline, Mass? And every single guy at the table raised his hand, but me. And I was like, Hey, maybe you should ask that question differently next time. Like, and have you not played this really exclusive club? So now I'm the one guy sitting there not raising my hand. And he goes, because, because I've played it like 10 times. And, you know, every time I've played this club, you know, I've, I've enjoyed it. The course is beautiful, but I saw something different this week. So now I'm like kind of interested. What did you see? And he's like, you know, I, I've, I've played the first hole and I was thinking about the first hole and how it's laid out and everything about it. You stand on the tee box and you look it down the fairway. And he goes, but then this week, because uh, they were doing the, uh, the U.S. Open there, he's like, they had a drone and they were showing the hole from the drone footage. You guys have seen this, the drone footage for different things. And they were doing a flyover of the first hole with the drone. He says, I saw things I never knew were there. There was the fescue and the, the mounds and there were rocks and there was undulation and there were traps. And he says there was trouble everywhere. This thing looked, looked so hard when you looked at it from above, but you could see all the trouble. And everybody was like, oh, yeah, true. I never thought about it that way. And I'm sitting there going, jackpot, that's a good sermon illustration. <laughs> we're in our message series called Get It, Got It, Good. I messed it up. <laughs> Get it, got it. Good. So wherever you are, do it with us because we're all doing this together. Remember, it's get it, got it, good. And this message series is a study of the New Testament book of Second Timothy. And the message um, for today is called Get Over It. Because what we're, what we're digging into in 2 Timothy in the second chapter is, is we're seeing that there's all kinds of troubles and all kinds of traps and all kinds of different things and ways that we can get into trouble in this world. And we need to get over it so that we can kind of get an overview and say, wait a minute, I see where there's trouble. And because this happens, like we're just minding our own business, doing our, our thing. And then the next thing you know, we, we wind up in, in, in trouble, we wind up in conversations we didn't mean to get into. We wind up saying things that we never would have imagined saying to that person. We wind up participating in activities that at the beginning of the day we wouldn't have thought would have been even possible. And sometimes it's because just when we're looking ahead, we don't see where the trouble is and where it lies. But one of the things about God is he gives us this, this different perspective, this overview, and he allows us to see some different things so that we can make different and better decisions. We can really get over it and see where the trouble will be. 
Our memory verse for the series is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. I'd love for you, wherever you are, to read this out loud with us together, even with like a smile on our faces, because this is a good powerhouse, empowering uh, word from God. So let's read it together. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Woohoo, that's good news right there. Let's get it, got it. Good. All right, here we go. Keep your head in all situations. If we could get over it and see what may be, lie, may be lying ahead of us and where the trouble might be, it'd be a lot easier to keep our head in all situations. Endure hardship. Okay, so then some of the difficulties and challenges that we find ourselves in, uh, when we get over it and we kind of see that there are going to be problems, we have the right perspective to say, okay, yeah, uh, I knew that was a possibility. That could happen. You know, God never said uh, you're going to live a, a trouble-free life. In fact, he said in this life, in this world, you will have trouble. He says, but take heart because I've overcome the world. He's with us in that trouble. So <clears throat> we can endure hardships. They're not such a, a shock or surprise. <clears throat> do the work of an evangelist. Like remember who you are, that you are a carrier of good news and that we are, we are good news people living in, in a bad news world in a world that is just fixated and fascinated with bad news and loves to share bad news and propagate bad news. But we have good news. We're people with good news and we get to go and share this good news that is fresh and powerful and alive for us and discharge all the duties of your ministry. When we get over it and we can really see kind of where we're going and get the perspective that God has for us, instead of just being all down in all that trouble, then we're able to discharge the duties of our ministry that God has called us to. And so our get it for this message, our get it is this, do your best. Do your best. I'm pointing a finger right at you. Do your best. I know it's not polite to point, but come on, do your best. So I, I have like a, a word for you, church. All right, here you go. If you are a follower of Jesus, if God has put his Holy Spirit inside of you, if you've said yes to his saving grace and, and received this from him and have this new identity as a child of God and a place in his kingdom, then God is calling on us to do your best. Do your best. You get it? Yes. You get it? Say, say woohoo if you get it. Do your best. And I'm not talking about the silly, like, you know, I'm going to do my Sunday best. I'm going to dress up to, to go to church, although a little effort might be okay from time to time. But let's just think about this. We, we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. I want you to know this. You are the church. So one of the things that happened is, is we replaced the body, the people of the church, and we started referring to buildings as the church. Well, even with that mindset, let's just think about that. If you were to, to show up at a, a church building for one church, any one of our outposts, and you were to show up at one of those and the grass wasn't cut, you know, that might, that might convey a message to you like, oh, I guess, I guess maybe they didn't care enough to cut the grass. Or you, you, you walk through the doors and there was no greeter there to say, welcome and glad you're here. And then you, you walked into the building and there was the trash hadn't been taken out and the carpet hadn't been vacuumed. And you went into the bathroom and, oh, dear Lord, we don't want to talk about that because church people are gross in restrooms. <laughs> Former custodian right here. I know. And if you, you walked into that space and it, it, was, it looked like nobody cared, you would feel like nobody cared. And the reason I point that out is like then if you, if you went into the worship service and and the band hadn't rehearsed. And the singers weren't given their best. And there was a sermon that was unprepared and, and, and like there was no effort there. You wouldn't be very likely to want to share that with anybody, would you? So at one church, we pray for one. It goes like this. God, please give me one person to share your love with. So wherever you are, can we pray that together? God, please give me one person to share your love with. Now, one way of sharing God's love, not the only way, but one way is by uh, inviting people to worship with you. And you can do that online, anywhere. You can do it from great distances or together. You can do it in buildings, but to invite people to worship with you. If we were not pursuing and giving our best, that would be something you wouldn't be very inclined to invite someone to participate in. 
I would say the same thing is true as you are the church. And so this is, you know, do your best. You are the church. So are you giving your best to Jesus? Are you giving your best for your ones? Or are we just getting into trouble and mailing it in? I want to challenge you. Give your best. Do your best. I know that growing up, that's what my dad and mom always told me was like, you know what, if I brought home a, a C on the report card, they would just ask the question. I knew it was coming too. Well, did you do your best? And if I said yes, then all was good. If I said no, then we needed to talk. And so my question to you as you just wrestle with this is, are you doing your best? Are you putting in the effort? We'll dig into 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says, do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter. Woo hoo. <laughs> Let's just skip it. Because those who indulge in it become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Gross. Among them are <laughs> him, uh, Himenaeus. Him, 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 and phi, Philetus, by Philetus, <laughs> who have departed from the truth. Seriously, by Philetus, departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. This, uh, these few verses right here, are, I think are so sweet. Just do your best. I mean, this is the Apostle Paul writing to a young man that he's mentoring and looks at him as a son in the faith. And one of the things he's reminding him is like, hey, do your best. Do your best to present yourself as one approved. And this thing about effort, it is so appreciated. It really genuinely is. Even things that don't necessarily work the way we intended. A little effort is so appreciated. I know at one church, we don't do everything perfect. There's all kinds of flaws. I know you guys think that it's, it just goes off without a hitch all the time. And that's not the case. We make mistakes and there's challenges and there's problems, but the effort is appreciated. Effort in showing God's love, effort in, in serving people, effort in being positive and encouraging and uplifting, effort in embracing people and seeing people through God's eyes, effort in, in reaching our world and, and sharing God's love in this way. I had a great experience at one of our outposts recently. I was over at the Manchester outpost uh, for worship on a Sunday morning. And um, I was sitting in the, the first service and the opening song that day was the song Help by the Beatles. And I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed anytime we, we do a Beatles song, I just think they're kind of fun. And, you know, the, the song was, was playing and I was captivated by the drummer. His name is Anthony and I, I hadn't met him before, but I just, he was kind of pushed back in the corner in a, behind a cage, you know, in glass and it was dark. Then you hardly see him, but I could just see him back there. And I was like, man, this guy looks like he's having fun. And then all throughout the worship service, there were all the songs, I kept coming back to the drummer and I'm worshiping. And the more I focused on the drummer, like the easier it was for me to connect with God. And I was like, this is really weird. I don't know this guy. I don't know if he's a good drummer or not because I don't really know how to critique music. But I'm like, there's something going on with this guy. So between services, uh, Ariana, the, the worship leader there, I, I said, hey, who's that drummer? And she goes, well, his name's Anthony. He's right there. You want to meet him? And I turned around and I left her. I was like, yes. So I go straight to this guy, Anthony. I'm like, dude, hey, I'm Bo. He's like, I'm Anthony. Now, he, he looked weird. I'm going to give you this. <laughs> okay, I'm telling you right now. He looked weird. Like the whole time I'm watching him drum, I'm like, okay, it's weird because he was wearing like a short sleeve, white button up, you know, dress shirt with a black, skinny black tie. And he was the only one in the whole building wearing a tie. And it just looked weird. And so I was like, I don't know. Okay, you're kind of goofy, but... I'm like, hey, dude, like, I love the drums. And, and he's like, yeah, you know, and then he says something weird. He looks at me and he goes, I, just, you know, was wondering if maybe you wanted to buy an encyclopedia. I was like, okay, this is getting even stranger. Why are you asking me if I want to buy an encyclopedia? And he, he kind of grabs his tie and is referencing his outfit. And I go, oh, like, cause he looks like an encyclopedia salesman. I was like, well, that joke didn't really land. And I was like, okay. 
And he says, yeah, you know, I, I got up this morning. I've been preparing all week and I was excited about doing a Beatles song, Help. And so when I was picking out my clothes, I thought I might try to look like Ringo. Aww. And I'm, I was like, I'm not sure that's the Beatle you would want to look like, but OK. <laughs> and and then it, I, it occurred to me what he did was he got dressed for the song he was playing. He put on an outfit that he thought looked like the Beatles. Now, here's the thing. It didn't work. Nobody knew why he was wearing that tie and that shirt. It did not work at all, but it did work. The effort, I'm telling you right now, it changed my worship experience. This, this person who was on stage because he cared and he tried and what he tried to do didn't work, but God worked through what didn't work. Can we get a woohoo for that? And that's how God like effort is appreciated. And so as you're praying for one, God, please give me one person to share your love with. Get to work, like go out and try some stuff. What you try may not work. Cause, and that's the thing, maybe you got frustrated, like you're like, I tried, you know, like, <laughs> it's because some of the things we try are really dumb, but effort is appreciated because even when it doesn't work, God can still work, but let's get to work. So do your best, all right, that's our get it. So get to work. A few quick things about getting to work. Get to work. Present yourself to God. All right, let's start right here. Before we do anything else, let's daily present ourselves to God. God, here I am. All right, not, and I don't mean like going to God with our to-do list for him for that day. Like, God, um, I got some things I need you to do for me today. And, you know, do them in Jesus' name. Amen. And then, you know, we move on. Hop to it, Skippy. Let's go. He's Lord, not me. He's Lord, not you. So we're, we're submitting ourselves to his lordship, but we present ourselves to him. God, here I am. Like first thing in the morning. God, what do you want to do today? God, I, I know that I, I'm, I'm going to go to work today. But Lord, will you use me at work today? Are you praying for your coworkers? Are you praying for your boss? Are you praying for your clients? Are you praying for your classmates and the people you'll encounter that day? It's one thing to, to pray for one. Oh God, please give me one person to share your love with. That's great. I'm, I'm in. I've been doing it for a long time and big believer in it. But then who are you going to see? Are you presenting yourself to God ahead of time to get ready? Yes. To do your best? To offer him your, your very best. That's why I say do it first thing in the morning. Some people are like, I like to wait, wait till at night. Do it both times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's double down on this. Start the day off and, and pray and present yourself to God, to God and say, okay, what do you have going on today? If we never meet with him, how in the world are we going to follow him? It's seriously, it's crazy. It's nuts to say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Christian means I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christ follower. And then we never meet with him. We never talk to him. We never listen to him. We never ask him what's up or what he wants to do. And we're always like, you know, going, hey, Jesus, come follow me. It doesn't work. So present yourself to God and get to work. Avoid godless chatter. This sounds good, right? Avoid godless chatter. Now, it, it's easy. This is the thing that like churchy religious people do. They're like, oh, yes, I'm so tired of all that godless chatter. You know, let's talk about the people who do that. <laughs> you know, Margaret's really bad. She gossips. <laughs> My goodness. I, I really believe here because the next example that, that Paul gives is he's going to talk about a couple of guys who are like in the church who are leading people astray and the godless chatter is actually bad teaching in like in a religious sense. And he's saying that that's what he's talking about avoiding, not just like, hey, hanging out with people. Although I am in favor of canceling small talk universally. <laughs> Big, I, I hate it so much, like despise small talk if we could just get rid of that. But I don't think that's what this is talking about here. It's like, you know what? Let's, let's pay attention. Let's avoid that godless chatter um, that is so focused on dividing people. It's always trying to divide and separate. We see it all over in our world. And for some reason, it's so attractive, really appeals to the sin nature inside of us. And it, and it creates these divisions and comparisons. Avoid all that nonsense. So in other words, stay off social media. Okay. <laughs> Get to work. 
correctly handle the truth. Correctly handle the truth. So Paul here, he does talk about that guy, uh, Philetus, by Philetus. And um, he says they've been throwing people into like confusion, telling them the resurrection's already occurred. And so what he says to Timothy, he's like, OK, wait, but you know that the Lord knows those who are his and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. He's like, you need to be able to correctly you know, handle this so that we're not always uh, throwing people into, into confusion and having them turn away from Jesus or, or miss out on what God is doing, but always pointing people back to Jesus. OK, I, that is so crucial here to correctly handle the truth. Jesus is the truth. Truth personified. We have that in Jesus. And so are we pointing people to Jesus or are we pointing people to an institution, uh, to dogma, uh, to activity, to another person? No, let's point people to Jesus. Are we pointing people to a political answer or an economic answer? What are we doing with all this godless chatter that's going on? It's not godless chatter if it's pointing people to Jesus. And so handle the truth. Uh, you have the truth. And so correctly handle the truth by pointing people to Jesus. That's our get it. Now you ready for our got it? All right, our got it is you are special. You are special. Wherever you are can, right now, can you say, I am special? I, I am, am special. special. Just like everybody else. <laughs> But it is true, right? Or get it, do your best. Why do your best? Why, why do your best? Because you are special. You are uniquely made, in, yes, in the image of God, uniquely made for the time and place where he's put you in your family, in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your school, your world. God has designed you and made you. And then if you have a relationship with him, he's given you spiritual gifts and a mix of those that go along with your talents and abilities and life experiences. You are so special. So do your best because you are special. We keep reading the next verse, verse 20. It says, in a large house, there are articles, not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. And I love what he's saying here. It's like, okay, wait, do you understand that you were designed and set apart for special purposes? You are special. And God has called you uniquely to where he has you. You are his plan A, and there isn't a plan B. As we're praying for one, like th this, is his, this is his answer. Like we want God's love to be shared in our world. God, please give me one person to share your love with. But if we don't share his love, his love's not getting shared. That's why so many, much of the time, like, like we're mad at God. Like, God, where are you in this? And he's like, I'm with you in this. Where are you? Are we stepping into that with people and into the tough stuff and, and walking with them in, in love and grace and truth? You are special. And so we have some I am statements. The first one, I am made holy. I am made holy. That's, that's what he says there. He's like, okay, those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy. There is nothing common or ordinary about the child of God. If you're a son or daughter of the king, then you have been set apart for special purposes, made holy in Christ Jesus, not by your effort, not by anything you've, you've done. So there's no pride in that, but by his work, by his grace, by his goodness. And so your life matters for holy purposes. We're not just going through the motions. We're not just trying to survive. I keep saying it. I'm, I'm done with survival mode. Are we done with survival mode yet? Ready to move into thrival mode? This is, he's made us holy. He's made you holy. Not to survive, but to thrive in him. And so like, even while we're doing ordinary things, those ordinary things become holy things because you are holy. Think about it. Like mowing the yard. Pray while you mow the yard. Now, now that becomes a holy moment. 
It's holy because you are holy. And in that moment, you, you pray, sing songs of, of praise while you wash the dishes. Which in my house, that's a good thing because the water's running and it drowns me out. <laughs> but you could sing worship songs like while you're washing the dishes, that's now, that's now holy. Um, you know, dance with Jesus while you vacuum. This is my vacuum dance. <laughs> I, I, always, I do dance when I vacuum. And, you know, this, this idea that, wait, whatever I'm doing, God has made me holy. So this is a holy moment. So I don't want to desecrate the moment. I mean, just think about that for a moment. I don't want to desecrate this moment because I am holy because he made me holy and he's with me. And so what are we doing here? This is very special. I'm also useful to Jesus. That's like mind blowing to me. Being useful for Jesus. The way I actually worded this in my notes as a reminder to me is, is to remind you all, listen, you're not a giant waste of skin. I don't care what your mom told you. You're not. You are treasured by God. Loved by him. Called by him. Adored by him. And you're also useful he has a use for you. This is God's plan and design to make himself known through his church, which is you. Imagine just the ramifications of that. He chose you. He looks at you and he says, you are useful. You matter. Your life matters. You're useful to him. And I love this. I am prepared for any good work. Prepared for any good work. It says it right there in the scripture. Made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. I can't help but think about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. For you are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so here's this beautiful tension that's being held right there in the scriptures, okay? You're saved by grace through faith, and it's not from yourselves. You didn't do it, you didn't earn it, you don't deserve it. God does this for us, he invites us into it. It's the free gift of God. We're not saved by the works we do. It's not like we're earning anything from God. Grace is a free gift, unmerited favor. But then it says, for you are God's handiwork, which again, I'll just reiterate to you, that means that you're a real piece of work. Every one of you, you are a real piece of work. Created in Christ Jesus and recreated in him through this relationship with him to do good works, but it gets even better, which he prepared in advance for you to do. Jesus, the trailblazer, the, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith who has gone before us and carved the, the trail, we're following him and he's setting up good works for us to do. Back to our guy, Anthony, it was to play drums for Jesus and try to dress like Ringo for some reason, but it didn't work, but it did work because the good work that, that God had prepared for him to do, one of them, one of them was to lead me in worship and I really needed it. And it was so sweet for me and whatever good work he's prepared for you to do today. These are the things that we want to do because I am made holy and useful to Jesus and prepared for any good work. You got it? Are you ready for our good? This is my favorite part. Chill out. This matters. Okay. Do your best. That's our get it. You are special. That's good. We get it. Now, what's good is chill out. Don't, because I know I could preach a message like this and I'm really concerned about like the tension of, of us getting all geeked up for Jesus. <laughs> and we're going to go out and we're going to do things for Jesus. And we're going to get after it for Jesus. And we're going to, we're going to love people and we're going to squeeze them and we're going to hold them and we're going to love them right into the kingdom. And you're going to love Jesus and you're going to be his. Mm. <laughs> Chill. Okay. Chill out. This is really good and really important. The next verse says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, 
and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be, what? Quarrelsome. But must be kind to everyone. I'm sorry, kind to who? Everyone. Everyone. Able to teach. Not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Can we just take a deep breath wherever you are? Take a deep breath. Chill out. Chill out. Do your best. You're special. Chill out. This really is the good life right here. This is it. We want to flee those evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. I mean, this is, this is the good life. The good life is found right there in the, in the pursuit of, of faith, righteousness, love, and peace. As we call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And so as we think about the good life, I would point out, all right, here's what that looks like. Be kind to everyone. Everyone. Not just to the people we think deserve it. Okay. God reveals himself to us through his kindness when we don't deserve it. And so to be kind to everyone, if we chill out there, then we just decide, you know what, I'm going to be kind to everyone. Not just to people who are kind to me or not just to people who behave the way I think they should behave or not just with people who agree with me, but I'm going to be kind to who? Everyone. everyone. Chill out. And if you find yourself about to not be kind, chill out. Like, they give yourself a time out. I think adults need timeouts more than toddlers. Before you, you type something on a keyboard that's unkind, chill out. Before you make a hand gesture that's unkind, chill out. This is, this is good for your soul. This is the good life. I also like to think of it in terms of uh, be kind, rewind. This goes way back to video stores, the VCRs and video cassette tapes. Um, when you would take a tape back, they, there was this whole campaign to have you rewind them for the next person. So they didn't pop it in and it was you know, showing the credits and then they had to wait for the whole thing to rewind. I, I think one of the best things we can do sometimes is, is hit pause when we're finding that we're about, to, we're about to go all the way to the end here. Rewind that back. Start from the beginning with kindness. And as we, as we do that, we can listen to people and find out where they are. The next part of the good life is able to teach. And I'm excited about this one, able to teach. Able to teach doesn't mean that you need to go to Bible college or seminary or get some kind of online education or listen to more sermons. Able to teach means that you are positioned relationally to share what you know about Jesus to another person. Can you hear this right now? This is not about having all the answers. I'm going to equip you for that fear right now. If somebody asks you a question about Jesus, the Bible, or anything for that matter, and you don't know the answer, what do you say? I don't know. I don't know. You tell the truth. You look at them and you say, I don't know. But we can ask God together. We can pray. We can listen. We can talk about it. We can, we can search together. But I don't know. Don't make stuff up. I'm, I'm dead serious right now. So much of the bad theology and bad doctrine that has led people astray, you know, this Philetus guy, <laughs> has been by people who probably got asked a question and they didn't know and they didn't want to look stupid and they wanted to be in charge, so they made something up. And then that got passed down. Knock it off. Able to teach means that you have a relationship with somebody where what you're excited about and what you're experiencing, you are able to hand it to them. So I recently had someone ask me like, hey, Bo, like I, I'm really loving Jesus and um, I, I want to I wanna share him with people, but I don't really know how to do that. What should I do? And I said, well, one thing you could do is like whatever you're experiencing with God and, and you're excited about in your relationship with Jesus, you could just share that with people, you know, because we like to talk about what we're excited about. And he goes, oh, 
dude, you're a genius. I'm like, I know. I mean, it's pretty, I mean, like for real, that's it. Like, stop worrying about all the things you don't know. This is our chill out point in the message. Stop worrying about all the stuff you don't know and just tell people what you do know. People that you, you're pouring into, people that you're kind to, people that you're doing life with. And I love this too, not resentful. Not resentful. The good life isn't resentful. Like we, so we can be free. This is such a, a beautiful gift of God. Like all the resentment that we harbor in our hearts towards other resentment because of the way somebody's harmed us, resentment because somebody got something we felt like we deserved, Re- resentment um, because maybe somebody didn't give us respect, resentment over things that we were trying to hold on to and we weren't able to. All that resentment towards people, it, it does creep into God too. And to be free from that, to be able to let that go, to chill out and go, wait a minute, what is this? What am I feeling? What's going on here? I, don't, I can let that go. And so examine what you feel. Like if there's someone in your life that you're not gonna be kind to, well, what's going on there? If there's someone in your life that you have no interest in sharing God's love with, what's going on there? If there's someone that you've, you've written off, like what's going on there? Like, I've actually heard people say, that person's too far gone. Think about that. I know that's not true. This is the good life. To love like Jesus loves. This is the love that he has for you. This is the love that we celebrate. This is the love that we remember and the love that we say yes to every time we gather together. This is the love that he is pouring into you and this is the love that he's inviting you to share. And so do your best because you are special and chill out. He's got this. And so I want you to know no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, God is for you, not against you, and he is inviting you to say yes to him when we take communion together. This is a time where we remember what he has done and the invitation that he has for all of us. Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he offered it to his friends. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. And he invites us to take, eat, remembering him. Remember what Jesus has done and say yes to him. Let's eat together. And Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of a new covenant. His blood that was shed for us. We remember that Jesus died for us and took our sin away. And it was buried with him. And he rose again from the grave, conquering sin and defeating death so that we can receive. So this cup is for you. If you're saying yes to Jesus, then to the king. Let's drink together. I would like to pray a blessing over you and then invite you to meet with Jesus. And hear from him. And to ask him to give you one person to share his love with. And let him do his work in you as he takes what was ordinary and makes it holy, makes you holy, makes us holy. So that his love can move through us in our world. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the powerful love of Jesus. Thank you that you lavish your love on us that you're generous, not cheap. That God, your love is limitless. Lord, we know that we'll never run out. And so as we are freely receiving, God, let us freely give. Please give us one person to share your love with. Lord, we ask that you do your work in us right now so that we truly are able to teach, able to share. 
everything we're experiencing with you in our world. We ask for that in Jesus' name.